we have been knocked off centre by the events unfolding around us. The structures in which we have trusted, structures of our routine, normality and control, have proven to be illusions, buckling under the chaos around us. It's hard to know where to look, with everything seeming to spin out of order in our midst. We are bombarded with graphs and predictions, news cycles and tweets, outrage and panic, disease and even death. And the spinning out of order runs deep within our world, our churches, our communities, our jobs, our families, and within our own hearts and minds. And so it is within these moments that we remember you, Yahweh, our Lord and our God, who did not run or turn from chaos, but who stepped into it, into the chaos at the beginning to create and bring order, into the chaos as Jesus to redeem and bring life everlasting, and into the chaos once again at the end of days, to wipe away every tear, each anxiety, all disease, and even death itself. Let us look to you, O God, who did not will this disease, but who wills to end it. And as we look to you, as we look for you, would you be found by us, your people? Would you be seen by us, heard by us, felt by us and known by us. Christ behind us, Christ before us, beside us, above us, below us and within. Hold our hearts, which are right now fearful and heavy, lonely and tired, and bring us peace. O God who sees, step into our chaos once again bring health to the sick, bring peace to the afraid, bring hope to the disconsolate, bring comfort to the restless, bring light to those in the dark, bring order, bring life, and have mercy on us. Amen. Welcome to our online service this morning wherever you are and whoever you're with, we pray that you feel really blessed to be with us this morning. Um, in a moment, we're going to have a time of worship followed by communion before John Mark comes to speak with us. Um, but before we worship, I'd like to start with these incredible words from, from Saul in the book of Timothy. The reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flee in the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Wherever you are, I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we join together and worship together.
vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, but you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah! 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 God of justice, Savior to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and not be served. Jesus, you have called us, freely we received, now freely What you require Send us out, fill us up and send us out, fill us up and send us out, fill us up and send us out.
everybody uh, from Wesley and Valerie we want to welcome you on behalf of Mount Sandal Christian Fellowship to our Lord's table and um, you'll just excuse me now while I put the uh, Reactolite lenses on so as I can read I'm going to read uh, some short passages of scripture firstly in Genesis the story of um, Isaac and Abraham going up the mountain at Moriah and this is what I want to read. And Isaac said to his father, My father! And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. We think of this as the lamb in Genesis. And then um, in the New Testament we have the story of uh, Jesus coming to John the Baptist. And we read in John 1 verse 29, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we want to think of this perhaps as the Lamb in Golgotha. And then we're going to read about the Lamb in glory. And I'm reading from Revelation chapter 5. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a Lamb, standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And now Valerie's going to pray for the bread just before we break it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to break bread and remember all that you have done for us in giving your Son that we might have eternal life. Amen. Lord, thank you for this wine that speaks to us about your blood that was shed for us and help us to love and serve you and may we glorify your name in all that we seek to do. Amen. Lord, as we reflect on the death of Isaac, uh, or the lamb in place of Isaac as a substitute, we think of our Lord Jesus who died on the cross for us. And we give thanks that he is now in glory and is worthy to be receiving all the honour and all the praise 
and all the glory that is due to him for all that he has done for us. And we give thanks for the understanding that that gives us of the surety of our salvation that at one day we will be with him in heaven. And we give thanks in his name. Amen. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much to Wesley and Valerie for uh, leading us in communion. Uh, thank you to Sarah for uh, leading us so thoughtfully in worship. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to jump right in uh, to what we're going to think about uh, this morning. Um, even, even if you've never seen a Mission Impossible movie, uh, maybe some of you haven't, uh, you probably know some things about it, even without knowing where it comes from. You probably know the theme music. Uh, you probably also know some bits of dialogue and plot, even if you don't know where they come from. Uh, and I guess in every single Mission Impossible movie, uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen them all, uh, Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, receives a message, uh, usually in a totally unnecessarily complex way. He never just gets a text message. It's always very technological and complex. Uh, and in that message, it says, your mission, should you choose to accept it, and then he's given a, a dangerous and difficult task. And then it says this message will self-destruct in five seconds. And from there, the story unfolds. Um, and I want to start there because I, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask this. Um, I wonder, do you know what your mission is uh, for your life? What is your mission for your life? What is your mission for this chapter of your life that you're in right now? Even what is your mission for today or for this week that's ahead of it, ahead of you? I uh, wonder, do you know what your mission is? Uh, we're going to be looking uh, during May and June uh, at an ancient book uh, that I think can actually help us answer that question. Uh, the book is at least two and a half thousand years old. The setting for the story is in the 8th century BC. Uh, but I want, to, I want to try and persuade you that this is a book that can speak to where you are living right now and help you figure out what to do with your days, help you figure out what your mission is in these days that you've been given. Um, I guess my, the, the book is the book of Jonah. That's what we're going to be, be reading. Um, and I guess my one line summary of the message of Jonah is this, is that it's a, a small book about a big fish, a grumpy prophet, and a God who has compassion for every person and every creature on this planet. Okay, so that's my one line summary. Um, and, and I said it's a small book and it really is. Uh, it's only four chapters long. Um, it takes about 10 minutes to read the whole book. And so I really wanna encourage you as we go through and explore together to read the book again and again, uh, maybe even today or later this week, uh, take some time and read the book um, and just at the beginning, for maybe for this week, uh, just kind of make a note of your honest reaction to the book, uh, whatever that is. Just note the things that you find puzzling or the things that you find intriguing or the things that bother you or, or whatever it is, uh, the things that inspire you or challenge you. Uh, maybe you want to write them down. Maybe you just want to note them in your mind. But for this week, just read the book and just make a note of what your honest reaction is. Uh, we're going to, this morning, just read uh, the first three verses of the book, just to get us into it a little bit uh, and, and set the scene. Uh, so this is reading from Jonah uh, chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So there's the, the beginning of a, maybe a book that's kind of familiar uh, maybe you read it a long time ago. Um, Jonah, I guess we could say, Jonah is given a mission, which is both dangerous and difficult, and he chooses not to accept it, and he therefore kind of self-destructs. 
Uh, so maybe we could, we could describe this beginning in that way. Um, so we're going to come back to Jonah in a little while, but I want to I wanna just take a pause, first of all. I want to I zoom out to the big picture of this, this kind of theme of mission in the Bible, because we need to set Jonah kind of in the bigger context of the whole story. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do that for a second. Think about mission in the Bible as a whole, and then we'll come back uh, to Jonah where we left him uh, in a moment. Uh, but I want to say two things about mission in the Bible as a whole. And the first one is this, is that God has a mission. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, that, that God has a, a mission. Uh, theologians, when they want to sound fancy, like to say things in Latin for no particular reason. So they like to call it the missio dei, but it simply means the mission of God. And I wonder if I was to ask you to describe God's mission in the world I wonder how you would describe it. Uh, I think there's probably lots of ways we could answer that question, uh, but I want to give you one of them. Um, at the beginning of the story of the people of God, uh, God called a man called Abraham, and he said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And then he says to Abraham, and I will make you a blessing. And maybe as we're reading that, uh, it's in Genesis 12, maybe we ask, how wide will that blessing reach? God is going to bless Abraham and make him a blessing. And we wonder, how wide is that blessing going to go? And this is what we read in Genesis 12. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Or as another translation says, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. That's how wide this blessing goes. So if we're asking, what is God's mission? According to that story about Abraham in Genesis 12, God's mission is to reverse the curse, the harm, the damage that's been done by sin, to bring blessing to all people, all families, all nations, all people that on earth do dwell, as it says in one of the old hymns, through the family of Abraham. That's his mission. And of course, Jonah is a son of Abraham. He's part of the, the people of Israel. And so he would have known that story about Abraham inside out. That was part of his uh, spiritual formation. And this should be deeply ingrained in his mind and heart, that God is going to bless Abraham and his family and is going to make them a blessing, and the blessing is going to go to all the peoples of the earth. So that's the first thing, is that God has a mission to bless all people through the family of Abraham. Uh, the second thing to say about what the Bible as a whole says about mission is this, is that God calls us to play a part in his mission. Presumably, he could fulfill his mission without us because he's God, but he chooses to involve us. He invites us to join him in his mission. He gives us a real part to play. He gives us each a specific part to play in that mission. Uh, and I'm sure you could think of lots of examples in the Bible of people who were called by God and given a part in his mission, um, including Abraham, who's called to go to a new country and start a new uh, nation. Uh, Moses, who was called to go and lead his people out of Egypt and to the promised land. Uh, we could think of David, who was called by God to leave his father's sheep and go and become king and rule over the nation. Uh, we could think of lots of stories of prophets in the Old Testament, who were called by God to go and speak his message to the people. But maybe there's a danger in picking those big names like Abraham, Moses, David, the prophets. Because um, I think we all believe that certain people are called by God and given a mission. So in the Bible, it was prophets and priests and kings. And today we might say it's preachers and pastors and missionaries who are called by God and given a mission. Um, so I want to make sure we hear this. I want to say it very simply, that God is calling you to play a part in his mission. don't know if you remember the story. One day Jesus was walking along the shore, Mark chapter 1, and he saw some ordinary fishermen mending their nets and he called them by name. And he said to them, come and follow me. And then immediately he said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And so I think we can say every ordinary disciple is called by Jesus 
First to come and be with him and to follow him, to keep company with him, but then also to be sent out to play a part in his mission in the world. Um, And he gives each of us a unique part to play in that story of mission. Um, I wonder, do you believe that? That he he designed you with your personality and your gifts and your quirks and your backstory. And he put you in your particular context in this particular moment in history so that you can be a blessing in a unique and specific way to the world. I wonder, do you believe that? Um, It says in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10, one of my favorite verses, we are God's workmanship or his handiwork, or his walking, talking works of art, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. There are good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. There's a part in his mission that is for you. I wonder, do you know what your part is in God's mission to bless the world? Um, Just before we come back to Jonah, um, just some thoughts I had this week that were helpful to me that might be helpful to you as well. Uh, we might think, whenever we think about our mission, uh, we might think about it on several levels. So um, you might think about your life mission, your mission for life, which is kind of a big idea, uh, your purpose for being on earth. Or coming down a level, we might think about your mission for this season of your life, this chapter of your life that you're in right now. Uh, as a teenager or as a parent with young kids or in middle age or in retirement or whatever it is. Because our mission, I think, can change in different parts of our lives and uh, as, we go, as we go along. Or then we could bring it right down to the, the very micro scale, the small scale, and talk about your mission for today. As you get out of bed today, tomorrow, what is your purpose? What is your mission? And I guess one of the thoughts I had this week was we often uh, tend to think that we need to figure out the big picture first, figure out our life mission, and then we'll maybe be able to work out what our mission is for this season, and then we can maybe work out what to do today. Uh, And maybe sometimes that's how it works, but I suspect it's often the other way around, that actually if we can start to work out what is ours to do today, then we may, as the days go by, start to get a sense of our mission for this chapter and this season of life. And then maybe even as time goes on, get a sense of that deeper calling that's written over our entire life. Um, I think if we could start with, what is God calling me to do, asking me to do, sending me to do today? Maybe we can start, the the bigger picture will start to fall into place. Um, And I guess I want to encourage you uh, that I think this is a really good time in these unusual days that we're in, in these days of interruption, of pause, of being out of the norm, to ask these kind of questions. What is God calling you to do today? What is God calling you to do this week? And what might he be calling you to do in the next chapter of your life uh, when lockdown ends and we go back into something like normality? What might God be asking you to do? What is your mission that he's calling you into what is your part in his mission in the world. So that's kind of our detour into mission in the Bible and maybe thinking about mission in our lives. Uh, But I want to come back to the book of Jonah um, and the verses that we read at the beginning of Jonah. Uh, And I want to suggest two things in these verses that we can say about God's call into mission. Uh, And the first one is this, is that God always calls us to arise. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that word when we were reading at the beginning of Jonah. God speaks to Jonah and he says, arise and go. Um, And I want to suggest that word is not accidental there. It's not just like Jonah happened to be sitting down, so God told him to get up. Um, I think it's a word that has deeper significance and meaning. The call of God in our lives is always a call to rise up to rise up out of slumber, out of apathy, out of dullness, out of boredom, from wherever we are slumped or slouching. God calls us to come alive, come awake, rise up. Maybe I want to suggest, I wonder what you think about this. We haven't always done a good job at communicating this 
Uh, many people find the Christian message kind of boring. And sometimes that has been our fault because we've given the impression that God calls people to come to him uh, so that we can get our sins forgiven, so that we're ready to go to heaven. And then there's not really much for us to do. There's a, a list of things that we're not to do, but otherwise we're just to sit around and sing hymns and wait for heaven. And we haven't given people really much of a picture of what it is that God might be calling them into. Uh, and I think that's kind of sad. It's kind of a tragedy. God calls us to arise. He calls us into life in all its fullness, to become fully human, to become fully alive, to become the people he created us to be, to join him in a life of risk and adventure and surprise and bringing blessing to the world. Uh, one Christian leader in the, the early church wrote this, that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. It brings God glory when people come fully to life. Um, God always calls us to arise. I don't know if you remember in John 5, Jesus met a man lying crippled by a pool and he'd been an invalid for 38 years. Um, I've always loved this story because Jesus asks the man a vital question, first of all. He says to him, do you want to be well? And then Jesus says to him, arise, pick up your mat and walk. And I guess what I'm suggesting is that Jesus comes to each of us where we are. He comes to me, he comes to you. Where, where we are damaged by sin and the brokenness and the hurts of the world. And he asks us, do you want to be well? And then he calls us to rise up and walk in newness of life. He always calls us to arise. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 calls it the upward call of God in Christ, which is a beautiful phrase, the upward call uh, to arise. So God always calls us to arise, but here's a second thing that's maybe more difficult. He sometimes calls us to go to Nineveh, by which I mean he sometimes calls us to do things that are difficult or costly or uncomfortable or even dangerous. Um, Jonah was called to go to the great city of Nineveh. I wonder what that means to us whenever we, we read it. Um, for those of you who love a good map, here is a map. Nineveh uh, was the capital city of the empire of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, which was the most powerful empire on earth. Uh, if you look at the map, that, that whole sort of purpley area is the Assyrian Empire, and it, it stretched over a large part of uh, the known world and that, that kind of uh, Middle Eastern part of the world. Uh, you can see if you look down to where Judah and Israel are on the coast, that the, there's kind of a finger of the empire coming nearer and nearer uh, to where Jonah lived and to where the people of God lived. Um, Assyria was a, a daunting, terrifying power, the most powerful empire on earth. And so that already makes it pretty daunting. If you look at the little blue area in the middle of the empire, um, that's where Nineveh is. That's where the, the capital and the center of the, the empire was. So Jonah is being called to go and stand in the heart of the world's most powerful empire and speak out against their evil behavior. Right? That's already pretty daunting as a task to be given. It gets even more daunting when we recognize that the Assyrians had a particularly scary reputation for cruelty and violence. They had almost developed cruelty and warfare into an art form of which they were proud. And if we can read in ancient texts, there were stories of the Assyrians burning children alive, displaying the skin of their enemies on the city wall, um, forcing friends and family to carry the heads of their loved ones on public parade through the city. Um, and there's more stories like that. I don't want to, uh, I maybe don't want to go into any more detail than that. But they, they gloried in their reputation and they made sure that it was spread around. They put those acts on uh, uh, murals and pictures and engravings to make sure that the, the word spread about their cruelty so that it would strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. And those are the people that Jonah is called. Go to the heart of that empire and speak out against their evil deeds. Um, 
Tim Keller has suggested uh, that maybe to, to try to even imagine the scale of it, uh, we'd have to imagine something like this. Imagine a Jewish rabbi being asked to go to Berlin in 1941 to speak out against the evils of the Nazi regime, stand up in the street and speak out against the horrors of what was going on. Tim Keller says in a kind of uh, great understatement, the prospects of success were none, the chances of death were high. Right? That's the kind of task that Jonah was given. So it's not actually hard to understand why Jonah do, didn't want to go. We sometimes give him a hard time. Um, as the book of Jonah goes on, we may wonder if there are also other deeper reasons why Jonah doesn't want to go, more, maybe more troubling reasons. Uh, and we're also going to need to ask troubling questions of ourselves, uh, like where is Nineveh for us? Where is that place we don't want to go? Where are those people we don't want to go and bring blessing to? Um, who are those people uh, in our lives? And um, we're going to get there uh, as we go on. But right now, we need to just be upfront about this. If you are open to God's voice and God's call in your life, he will sometimes ask you to do things that are difficult and costly. Um, he may sometimes ask you to go to Nineveh. Um, and so you may be tempted to respond like Jonah, which brings us back to Mission Impossible and back to the other thing that the Mission Impossible movies are famous for, uh, which is Tom Cruise running. Uh, all through the movies, running and running and running. Um, and so Jonah does a runner. Jonah runs in the opposite direction from the way God is calling him. Uh, and he goes to get on a boat to a place called Tarshish. Uh, we don't know exactly where Tarshish was, but it was somewhere towards Spain or Gibraltar. Um, it was known in the ancient world kind of as, as far as you could go without dropping off the edge of the world. It was the end of the world. Um, and so I think there's a kind of comedy to the way the story is told uh, as we read it. God calls Jonah to go inland, so he goes to sea. God calls him to go east, so he goes west. God calls him to go to the heart of the empire, the center of civilization, so he goes to the edge of the world. Um, maybe we can understand why Jonah ran. Um, I don't know if you've ever run away from God's call in your life. And there are all kinds of reasons why we might do it. Uh, very understandable and very human reasons why we might want to run, why we might resist what God is asking us to do. Uh, but I want you to notice what happens to Jonah. Um, we, we noticed that God's call to Jonah was to arise. And for a moment, it looks like Jonah might obey. And the story says he rose up. And so he, you might think he's going to obey. But then... It says he goes down. And actually, that's repeated all through the chapter. Uh, if it's not repeated in your translation, maybe have a look at, a, at another one. But I think this is very deliberate. God tells him to arise. But Jonah goes down to Joppa. And then he goes down into the ship. And later, he goes down into the very bottom of the ship to sleep. And eventually, uh, without giving the whole story away, I think you know where this goes. He goes down into the depths of the sea. And in chapter two, it says he goes down to the roots of the mountains. So the whole trajectory of the story is Jonah going down and down and down and down till he can go no further. Um, God's call in our lives can be challenging, but it always leads us upward to more life, to more freedom, to more joy. It can be daunting, it can be difficult, it can be costly, it can be dangerous, but it's always an upward call. It can feel at times easier to run the other way. That can seem like the safer option. Um, but actually, part of what the story of Jonah is telling us is that that always leads us downwards in a spiral um, towards self-destruction. Um, we're told Jonah was trying to run away from God's presence. I wonder, did you notice that as we read it? It says it twice in the story. He was trying to get away from the presence of God or the face of God. Uh, maybe immediately we think of Psalm 139, where it says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, that's what Jonah was trying to do. 
even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Maybe it reminds us that it's futile for Jonah and for you and I to run away from God. We can't escape from his presence no matter where we run to. We find him there waiting for us. But it's also foolish, deeply foolish for Jonah and for us to run away from God's presence because his presence is what we most need. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, there is blessing and life and healing. Away from his presence is only darkness and gloom and self-destruction. Um, it's worth saying as we finish, I think this is important, you can run away from God in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can run away from God in a very obvious way into rebellion and wild living and uh, really obvious self-destruction. Or you can stay religious and respectable and good living and well-behaved, but you can still run away from the presence of God by not listening to his voice, not seeking his presence or his face. And either way, our hearts become cold and hard and the path leads down and down and down. Um, I wonder if there are some of us this morning maybe tuning in or listening. And if we're being honest, we know we've been running away from the presence of God, the voice of God. Uh, maybe other people around you know it, maybe they don't. Uh, maybe you've been drifting away rather than running away. Um, if that's the case, can I encourage you this morning to turn around, um, come back to the, the presence of God, because he will not only receive you back with open arms, but he will also ask you again to come and join him in, in his mission to go and bring blessing to the world. And he will invite you again into that adventure of going with him to bring blessing to all the people of the world. Let's pray together as we finish this morning. And then we're going to sing one last time. Uh, let's pray. Father, I want to pray uh, this morning, maybe especially for anybody who knows in their heart of hearts this morning that they've been running away from the presence of God, from the voice of God. And maybe for all kinds of understandable reasons. And um, Father, maybe we know that when we come to God, when we come to you, sometimes you ask us to do things that are difficult and costly. Father, I want to pray this morning, would you help us to trust you that although you sometimes ask us to do things that are hard or scary or dangerous or difficult, your heart and your desire for us is always to lead us upward to more and more life, to more and more freedom, to more and more joy. Father, help us to trust you that when you ask us to do something hard, it's because you want to bless us and you want to bless the world through us. Father, if there are some of us this morning who are running from you or resisting you or drifting away from you, would you give us the courage this morning to turn around and come back to the God who loves us? Father, I want to pray for all of us this morning. Uh, would you rekindle in us this morning maybe a sense of excitement, a sense of anticipation um, at the thought that the God of the universe wants to invite us to play a part in his mission, to bring blessing to all people on earth. Father, would you kindle in us a curiosity to want to find out what our part in that mission might be? To ask, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do this week? What do you want me to do in the, the years that are ahead? Father, help us to find our part in the mission. Help us to find the good works that you've prepared for us to do. Help us to find what is ours to do and to do it with glad hearts. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let me walk upon the waters wherever you